scripture reading this morning is from Mark 12, 28, 31, which echoes the Deuteronomy verse, the first commandment. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that, he answered them well. He asked them, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, thank you, Jim. Well, good morning, friends. So here we are on this first Sunday of Lent, getting ready to make our journey towards Easter together. You know, on Wednesday night, uh, a group of us gathered here in the sanctuary, and we spent some time in prayer and confession. We were invited to uh, embark on the the Lenten disciplines, which includes prayer and fasting and self-denial, in scripture reading, in doing acts of good and charity, And we had this invitation to be part of those disciplines as a way to kind of prepare ourselves for the the season of Easter that is coming um, 40 days anyway from Ash Wednesday. We gathered here, we sang songs, we came forward at the end of that service, and some of us gathered together and and had the the ashes placed on our forehead as a remembrance that we are merely mortal and as a symbol of grief for those things that separate us from experiencing God more fully and uh, an act of realizing that God is the one who is ultimately in control and the one who gives us life, lest we think too much of ourselves. I have a friend who uh, posted on Facebook this last week that there is no other place where someone can say look someone in the eye and remind them that they are going to die and to have that person look back in your eye and say thank you, right? So here we are in this season of Lent. If you're not familiar with uh, the the seasons of the church or maybe you came from a tradition that didn't observe Lent or things like that, let me kind of give you a a quick refresher about what this season is about. For, For centuries, Christians have used uh, what we call a a Christian calendar and divided the year into certain uh, seasons as a way to help us kind of relive the story of the gospel and relive the story of Scripture in our lives. And so the year is divided into different times of the year like Advent and Christmas and Lent and Easter and Pentecost and some of those other things as a way to, to relive the story of what God has revealed to us in Scripture. And for centuries before Uh, The the date of of Easter, Christians would gather together and set aside 40 days, not counting Sundays because every Sunday is a little Easter, right? And 40 days before Easter as a time of preparation, as a time to prepare for the celebration that we realize there's an empty tomb, that the work of God in us and the work of God in the world is bigger than even death itself, And in those 40 days, we spend some time remembering who we are. We spend some time looking at ourselves and our hearts. We spend time doing the things that we know we probably should have been doing as a way to lead us to Easter. The 40 days comes from kind of an idea that's reminiscent of of Jesus after he was baptized by John the Baptist, goes into the wilderness for 40 days to prepare himself before he begins the earthly ministry that he Uh, that he does here on earth uh, uh, with us. And then also the idea that Moses was up on Mount Zion for 40 days spending time with God before he received those Ten Commandments. And so it's a way for us to kind of relive this story, to, to hear anew this story of what God is doing in the world. So we kicked that season off on Ash Wednesday. We gathered together, took those uh, ashes on our forehead, and began this journey together. Now, this is my first year to get to spend this season of Lent with you. I'm really excited to be able to do that with you. And over the next seven weeks, as we uh, make this journey to Easter together, I'm going to be sharing some ideas with you about what a a spiritually mature person is or a spiritually mature person does. And we're going to have some help along the way as we do this. We're going to get some help from a 
Bible scholar and professor named Scott McKnight who lives in uh, the Chicago area. Scott wrote a book a few years ago called The Jesus Creed, and he gives us an image of what Jesus put forth to us as a, a spirituality of mature people. And so we're going to be using some of his ideas and some of the things that Scott talks about to help us make this journey uh, to Easter together. So having said that, as we begin this journey together to Easter and as we, we look at what a spiritually mature person is really like, and as we look at what Jesus told us a spiritually mature person is like, it's important for us to understand the spirituality that Jesus was immersed in in first century Palestine. One of the hallmarks or one of the anchors of the Jewish idea of a mature spiritual person was rooted in something we call the Shema. We heard it read for us, uh, Jim read it for us. It's a passage from Deuteronomy in which we, uh, the, the Jewish people were reminded that the Lord is one and that you should love the Lord with all of your mind, with all of your body, with all of your strength. And it was so fundamental to the Jewish people. It was the way that they found their identity. It proclaimed to them that the Lord was the one God of Israel. And that they should do all that they can to devote themselves to God. And this law reminded them that they were chosen people who were called by God to be devote followers of who uh, God truly was. And the way that they followed God, the way that they devoted themselves to God, was to follow the, the Torah, the law and the teachings that had been passed down to them from Moses and their ancestors. And so the way that they showed their devotion to God was by following the, the Torah. And that was part of their identity, part of their religious life together. It was so important that the scripture that we read today said to teach their children to talk about it when they are at home and when they are away, which is code for all the time. When they rise and when they uh, go to bed at night, they should say these words over and over again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and you should serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your strength. So much so that they would write it. In fact, uh, they still, in uh, most uh, Hebrew and Jewish traditions, they still write on their doorpost that phrase, the Shema, on their doorpost. If you have friends who are, are part of the Jewish faith, they will touch it as they walk in and as they leave their home. Some traditions in the, the Jewish tradition still to this day write it on a, a scroll and they wear it in a little box on their forehead. On the fringe of their clothes, they say it three times a day in the morning and at noon and at night before they go to bed. It is the anchor, it is the crux of the identity of the Jewish people. It is the key to a mature spiritual life in the Jewish tradition, at least in first century Palestine, and really today still in many Jewish communities. That is the identity of what it is to be Jewish. The Lord your God is the one God of Israel that you should serve that Lord with all that you have. So how does Jesus fit into this idea of spirituality in first century Palestine and this idea of, of the Shema? Well, let's skip forward to Mark chapter 12, the passage of Scripture that we heard read today. There's been a, a point in which some of the Pharisees and the scribes have come and they don't uh, have very um, happy and loving feelings towards Jesus. And so they're trying to constantly trip him up or, or catch him in some kind of false doctrine or false teaching. And, and he just has just spent some time answering some of the questions and he's answered them so well that the uh, Pharisees and the scribes are arguing among themselves. And an expert in the law comes up and sees that Jesus has answered so well, and he walks up to Jesus and he says, so tell me this, of all the laws that our ancestor Moses gave to us, what is the most important? Of all the laws, you know how many laws there are through Deuteronomy? How many laws there are about whether you can eat bugs or you can't, or any of those, I mean, there's hundreds of them. Which is the most important, Jesus? And Jesus responds with, the Shema, this prayer from Deuteronomy that, that Jewish people have been reciting for centuries every morning, noon, and night, the thing that they have written on their doorposts, the thing that some of those, maybe even in the crowd, have written in a box on their forehead. He says, the Shema back to him, he says, the most important law is that you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your strength. 
But, Jesus always adds a but, but he adds this phrase, and that you should love your neighbor as yourself. In these two laws, all the others hinge. Now, when Jesus says that, this is not just a, a little phrase that Jesus throws out there. For Jesus to say that the most important thing to do, the most important thing in Jewish spirituality, to be a mature spiritual person in the Jewish faith was to love the Lord your God with all that you have and that there is one God. But then to add that phrase and that you should love your neighbor as yourself is revolutionary. I mean, it would be as if there was some liturgy that we followed every week in the church, so say the Lord's Prayer, and every week we say the Lord's Prayer, and then all of a sudden I just decided to throw in another stanza into the Lord's Prayer. But not only that, it was Scripture that was divinely inspired to their ancestor Moses. And so for Jesus to make that, that change in which he says that to be a spiritually mature person, not only do you love God, but you love others as yourself, is a huge change. For the Jewish community, their identity revolved around loving God and being devoted to God and serving God by following the rules of the Torah. And Jesus flips that on its side when he says, oh, you should do that, but you should also love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, he turns this idea of loving, uh, of the, the whole basis of the Jewish identity and who they are as being, one, a people who love God, to being people who love God and who love others. Scott McKnight says that this is, in fact, a creed that Jesus uses and that all of Jesus' ministry flows out of this idea of loving God and loving others. Because in that little phrase in which he adds that, that phrase to the Shema that says that we should love others as we love ourselves, we should love our neighbors. He turns the idea of the spiritual heart of who the Jewish people are, of one that is about following laws and rules to escape wrath and punishment to a change of heart that brings about justice and peace. Do you see how in that little phrase the whole thing becomes different? And Scott McKnight in the Jesus Creed says that this is the creed that, that Jesus uses in all of his ministry with us. Scott McKnight would say that, that this is the fulfillment of the law, that we would love God with all that we are. And because we love God with all that we are, we are able to love our neighbor as ourself. And rather than showing devotion by just following the rules of the, the Torah, of all the laws that had been given to Moses, we show our love for God by loving others and by following Jesus. That's the first time that Jesus amends the laws of Moses, amends the spiritual life of the Jewish people. As kind of a goof this morning, I titled my sermon, The Second Amendment. Uh, for those of you that thought I was going to talk about guns today, you can put your 38, you can put your 38 back in your purse or your Glock back in your, uh, your heel holster. But Jesus amends two very important parts of Hebrew tradition. The first amendment is that Jesus amends the Shema, the anchor, the, the boulder at the, at the middle of how Jewish people understand themselves and God. So what's the second amendment that Jesus shares with us in these passages of Scripture? Let's turn to, to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. There's a, a passage in Luke where his, he's, uh, Jesus has spent a long time praying, and one of his disciples comes up to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. And Jesus gives them this pattern for prayer. Now again, at the heart of the Jewish identity and who they were was this uh, prayer or this statement, uh, a, a creed called the Shema, about loving God with all that you are. And there was another important prayer that uh, was prayed during the, the daily prayers at morning, noon, and night in the temple called the, uh, the Kaddish. And the Kaddish reads this. It's a pretty long prayer, so I'm going to give you the first part of it and the last phrase. This is what the Kaddish says, and it's prayed three times a day. May his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. 
blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, honored and adored, lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be He. May He establish His kingdom in your lifetime and during your days and within the life of the entire house of Israel, speedily and soon. And let all say, let it be so. This is the Kaddish. Again, another prayer that glorifies God that they would recite three times a day at least during their daily prayers that glorified God and called for God's kingdom to appear not someday, but in their lifetime. In fact, during if you've ever been to a Jewish funeral servant, uh, service, uh, they will often pray the Kaddish as part of the, the, the liturgy of the funeral in praying that before all of us pass away like our friend, would we see God's kingdom come? And so at the heart of this prayer that, that is at every, uh, every uh, morning and every evening, every noontime prayed in the, the temple, this Kaddish prayer that asks for God's kingdom to come and the glory of God to be given, then Jesus says, when you pray, this is how Jesus says you should pray. And when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who has sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation. I mean, we, we add some little linking phrases as we recite it and as we've memorized it, as we pray it every Sunday. But do you see at the very beginning of the way that Jesus calls us to pray and says this is how you should do it? The beginning of that prayer is the Kaddish. Hallowed be thy name. Lord, be glorified. Your kingdom come and your will be done just as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come in our lifetime and in the lifetime of Israel. Do you see how he's giving us the exact same idea of loving God, of proclaiming the glory of God? And then Jesus adds a phrase. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I mean, he has that same idea of loving God and loving others. The first part of, of the Kaddish is about glorifying God and, and making sure that we proclaim the goodness of God and praying that God's kingdom would come. The second part of the Lord's Prayer is a corporate prayer in which we pray for others. We pray for us. Us. The, uh, I have a friend from the South who would say, we pray for y'all, Right? We don't pray, Lord, give me my daily bread. Lord, forgive me of my sins. We pray, Lord, forgive us, all of us. I mean, he makes this, this connection, this idea of moving from just merely loving God by following the rules as a way to avoid punishment and a way to avoid wrath to telling us that the kingdom of God is about loving God and loving our neighbor. Changing the idea of, of spirituality and as a mature spiritual person to be someone who is just afraid of breaking the rules and being punished by God to someone whose heart has been changed and who does the work of the kingdom of God to bring about justice and peace. These are two very different things. And Scott McKnight would say in the Jesus Creed that all of those things are what are at the heart of what Jesus tells us in Scripture. The message of Jesus comes to us through this filter of loving God and loving others. Now I mentioned at the beginning of, of this sermon about the Shema, and the Shema was a prayer that was recited three times a day, in the morning and in the noon, uh, noontime and before you go to bed at night. When you got your bulletin this morning, hopefully there was a little card, hopefully it didn't fall out when you grabbed it. How many of it did it fall out and you had to bend over and pick it up? That was my, uh, my Lenten discipline of exercise for Lenten, right? Is that you know? So I have these printed up for us, and I, I want you to be able to take this home as a reminder. And I'm going to challenge you during the season of Lent to say these words. I mean, for centuries, people of faith have been reciting this prayer or this creed. I'm going to give you a little card. You can put it on your bathroom mirror in the morning if you want as you're brushing your teeth and as you scare yourself looking into the, the mirror with your hair all a mess and everything in the morning. You can pray this prayer. 
Put it, probably don't put it on your windshield because you need to see, right? That's probably a bad place for it. Maybe put it at your office desk. If you need more than one of them, we have some more. We can get you more if you'd like another one. But here's my challenge to us, that you would take this card, put it someplace that would remind you three times a day to pray the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I'm going to challenge us to pray that three times a day. And see if that makes a difference. Imagine if you started your day every day by saying these words. Imagine if the last thing that was on your mind before your head hit the pillow was these words. Imagine if when you were getting lunch and the waiter gets your order wrong, you said these words. I'm going to challenge us during the season of Lent to recite this, as Scott calls it, a Jesus creed. And see if it makes a difference in us. Because at the heart of who Jesus is and at the heart of what Jesus calls us to be in the kingdom of God is that we're called to love God and we're called to love our neighbor. When I was in uh, third grade over at uh, a church in Richland growing up, we had an intern program. And I can remember Tony Peterson telling us that God has two rules. One, first rule is that you love God. The second rule is you love everybody else. That's what God calls us to do and to be. So I pray that as we begin this journey of Lent together, I pray that we'll embrace this Jesus creed. And as we recite this prayer together over the next 40 days, I'm excited to hear what happens in our lives as we remember we're called to love God and we're called to love everyone else. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to be sharing the elements of communion this morning. And so there's a, a liturgy that we're going to follow. It will be up on the screen in front of us. But let's join together as we celebrate God's presence with us and as we embark on this season of Lent. And let's join together in these elements of communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to God. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was in the upper room with his disciples getting ready to celebrate the Passover meal with them. And as they began that Seder meal together and as Jesus was, was there around that table with the rest of his disciples, he gave thanks for the bread that was there at the table and he broke it. He passed the bread around to each of them and he said, this is my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins and every time you eat from this bread, I want you to remember me. And then as the meal had come to an end, Jesus took a cup that was there on the table he gave thanks for it. It was a cup that was waiting for a prophet to return and declare redemption for the Jewish people. No one ever drank from this cup, but Jesus took this cup and gave thanks for it, and he passed it around to each of his disciples, and he said, take and drink from this cup. This is a new covenant I make with you and with many. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins, and every time you drink from this cup, I want you to remember me. In these very simple elements of bread and a cup, Jesus again amends this great meal. Tells us that it means something bigger and deeper than we ever thought it could be. He made it symbols of forgiveness, made it symbols of grace, made it symbols of who we are in our journey to love God and to love each other. So in remembrance that Christ is with us, we offer ourselves, our gifts, our shortcomings, and all that we are in life's journey, and we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Spirit <clears throat> excuse me, on all of us here and on these elements we will feel, these elements we will touch, and that we will taste. 
May they be symbols of your body broken and your blood poured out. May we be for the world your body redeemed by your sacrifice. Amen. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.